this year we're expanding our geography and we, we have speakers from, uh, well, at least from this hemisphere. And um, uh, so today it, it's, a, it's an exceptional pleasure to introduce David Nelson, who is uh, also a member of advisory committee of the Institute. David Nelson uh, received his PhD from Cornell University in seven, 1975. After that, he moved to Harvard as a junior uh, fellow of Society of Fellows, Harvard Society of Fellows. In 1978, he became a professor at Harvard University. So the main um, areas of uh, research for David are uh, condensed matter, both hard condensed matter and also soft matter. And he's probably most known for his work on uh, dynamics of two-dimensional surfaces. And today's talk, he'll, he'll probably tell us about uh, statistical mechanics of two-dimensional surfaces. Uh, so for his work, David received many prizes, including Buckley Prize for his work in soft matter physics for uh, the um, uh, most recently, the Honor Medal from uh, the Niels Bohr Institute in Denmark. And uh, so the, the title of today's talk of David will be uh, statistical mechanics of mutilated sheets and surfaces. So David, please, I pass the word to you. Uh, I, I kindly ask everyone to keep micro microphones switched off, but uh, David suggested that uh, he'll make some pause, pause during the, his talk. So uh, if someone has some urgent questions during that, uh, you, you can go ahead and ask the questions. But in general, please sign up in, in our chat to make the, the, the question. So David, once again, uh, thank you very much for accepting our invitation and uh, we can pass to your talk. Thank you very much. I will now try to share the screen and hopefully viewers begin to see some slides. Good, are you, are you seeing what looks like a slide, uh, Dimitri? Yes, that, that's right. Fantastic. So it's a great pleasure and an honor uh, to uh, speak to uh, uh, especially friends in Brazil and friends uh, in the uh, IIP and Natal and Alvaro, very especially. And um, uh, I, uh, I'd like to uh, tell you today a, a, a story that starts with some fairly ancient history. Um, it has to do with an attempt um, about 30 years ago to generalize uh, theories of linear polymer chains. It's a problem in soft matter over here. Uh, Paul Flory, the great polymer chemist, uh, sort of pioneered this field. And then uh, Pierre Gilles de Gênes uh, followed up. And uh, there are at least two Nobel Prizes trying to understand these linear polymers. But in these ancient times, like 30 years ago, um, many of us were interested in trying to generalize this problem uh, to uh, sheet polymers of various types. And uh, to make a brief summary of what was figured out in those days um, was that these um, sheet polymers floating around in solution uh, uh, are bound together in such a way that they have a shear modulus, uh, but they, uh, even despite thermal fluctuations, can have a, a kind of low temperature flat phase. Uh, let me see if I can produce this uh, fake laser pointer. This is a simulation of these uh, objects which are highly wrinkled because of um, entrop entropically driven thermal fluctuations, but they remain flat. And if I think of the normal as a kind of Heisenberg model type order parameter, uh, there's long range order in the normals. And um, uh, that's something which uh, many people in condensed matter physics uh, thought was uh, impossible. Um, there's a 2D broken continuous symmetry here that violates something called the hohenberg merman wagner theorem. Um, it uh, violates it for a good reason. It's not that the theorem is wrong, it's that it doesn't apply for various subtle reasons, as uh, I'll try to illustrate along the way. If you want a, a recent review, um, uh, Sinai and, and, and Bari have a nice summary of what's been figured out. And all of this um, physics received uh, a new life recently. Uh, even 30 years ago, we were thinking about um, 
realizations of this kind of problem uh, with sheet polymers made of stiff covalent bonds. Um, of course, the famous example now is graphene, uh, but uh, this is a picture of the so-called rag phase uh, of uh, molybdenum disulfide from Rust Chianelli, and it sort of looks like a crumpled piece of paper. And uh, I'd like to convince you that these very thin objects, when they're crumpled or deformed in some interesting way, um, have a lot of deep uh, challenging problems, especially when thermal fluctuations are involved. And this uh, field received an enormous boost uh, five or six years ago uh, from the, the beautiful work of Paul McEwen's lab um, uh, at, at Cornell. And what you're seeing here suspended in water is a 10 micron wide ribbon of a atomically thin sheet of graphene. And as this cartoon uh, suggests, there's a, actually a magnetic um, pad at the bottom, uh, which can be rotated around. We can use, even use a refrigerator magnet if you want. And here at room temperature in the water, you can see uh, Melina Bliss and Paul McEwen and colleagues torturing this uh, poor ribbon, um, twisting it back and forth um, in interesting ways. And uh, this is done at room temperature. And I want to convince you later on in the talk that the mere fact that there are thermal fluctuations makes this um, ribbon uh, 4,000 times stronger than it would be at zero temperature. So that's one of the, the, the things that I will focus on a little bit, at least at the beginning of this talk. Um, here is another remarkable thing, an atomically thin graphene spring, um, which um, is being uh, pulled and, 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 and relaxed. And I think they did it you know, tens of thousands of times. It never broke. And you can see that there's all sorts of cool things happening, including a kind of an escape into the third dimension uh, as the uh, elements of this uh, laser cut spring are twisting and, and, and turning in response to the pull. This is sometimes called kirigami, and this is uh, atomically thin kirigami done in water subject uh, to atomically thin room temperature kirigami. thermal fluctuations. So that, with that introduction, in water, um, uh, I'm going to try to tell you a little bit about the statistical mechanics of uh, so that, sheets. And if there's time at the end, I'm going to try to tell you a little bit about Homage to my, my friend of, and uh, so, teacher, John Hutchinson, uh, I'll tell you maybe a little bit about shells. Uh, but I'll start with a review of um, the, the statistical mechanics of thin plates. And uh, there's a dimensionless number. Uh, that you can define for even for atomically thin things like graphene called the Fappel von Karman number. It's sort of like a Reynolds number in fluid mechanics. And when we go to finite temperature, we have strongly scale dependent elastic parameters like the bending rigidity and the Young's modulus. I then want to talk, you about, talk about some very recent work uh, done during the shutdown with my collaborators, Abby Plummer and Paul Hanakata. Uh, about the physics of puckers. Uh, these are the mutilations uh, of the title in these fluctuating sheets. They are localized regions of positive Gaussian curvature. And we set them up in such a way, at least in our simulations, that they are the mechanical analogs of easing spins. And uh, they turn out to order antiferromagnetically uh, in a fluctuating background of uh, flexural phonons. And then if there's time at the end, I'll talk about what happens if there's a background curvature, which is somewhat older work done with Jason Pelos uh, and Andre uh, Kazmierz. So uh, this is where we're headed. Um, uh, any questions at this point? Uh, it's a small enough audience. I don't mind uh, stopping and answering questions if there are any right now. Okay. Hey, can, can I do it? Please. Dave Nelson, you said that uh, you are not violating the Merlin Wagner's few theorem. Could, could you yes. state why you are not uh, violating? Yeah, um, I, I, rec I recommend you take a look at Sinai's paper. But uh, the idea, one way to think about it is that the normals look like Heisenberg spins. It's a great question. Um, uh, and uh, if, I, if I look at them, uh, they have a nearest neighbor interaction, uh, continuous broken symmetry when 
the sheet is approximately flat and so forth. But because they're embedded in a surface with a shear modulus, there are constraints on their fluctuations. And in particular, they can have longitudinal spin waves, but not transverse spin waves. If I think of an analogy of spin waves by tilting uh, the normals. And the way we escape from the merman wagner theorem or the Hohenberg uh, theorem um, is by uh, incorporating these constraints. And you'll see explicitly uh, what is effectively a long range interaction that allows you to evade. So that's a, a brief summary. Um, other questions? Right, thank you for your answer. <laughs> right. Okay, so um, here's, here's how you set up this theory and you can, um, Look, uh, look in a uh, beautiful book by Coiter uh, uh, and uh, John Hutchinson's papers also, and Landau and Lifshitz is where most physicists uh, learn about it. But it's a, it's a very simple looking uh, starting point with an elastic sheet, say it's a square elastic sheet uh, at zero temperature, and then it gets stretched and deformed in various ways and this little element of length, uh, dr0 gets, gets changed into something else. Um, and we can look at uh, in-plane and out-of-plane uh, displacements or phonons uh, if uh, in the language of solid state physics. So U1 and U2 are in-plane phonons. F is an out-of-plane displacement. And it turns out that the physics of stretching the sheet uh, is summarized in this strain tensor. It's not the conventional strain tensor that uh, would occur um, in, a, say, a three-dimensional elastic solid, but it has this extra term with these out-of-plane displacements. Um, and then once we have this strain tensor, which tells you uh, basically uh, the change in the metric when things get distorted, uh, we can make an elastic energy uh, and a bending energy, which are shown down here. This, the, 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 this um, elastic or stretching energy involves uh, contractions of the strain tensor, elastic constants like the shear modulus, and then mu plus lambda is the bulk modulus. And then there's this bending energy. And it turns out because the sheet is uh, maybe immersed in water or floating around in a vacuum, uh, there has to be a rotational invariance to this thing. And as a result, there's a very soft restoring force out of the plane uh, that's uh, parameterized by this bending elastic constant. So one way to think about it that I like is that this uh, out of plane displacement is a kind of uh, tensorial vector potential um, modifying these gradients of the displacements. Um, and uh, that has important consequences and allows you to couple, as you'll see, to the Gaussian curvature of this problem. So the take home message from this slide is that these out of plane displacements, in particular, uh, these are sometimes called flexural phonons, they create this matrix vector potential. And they allow the, um, the system sometimes to escape softly with small restoring forces into the third dimension. So this is a, a Laplacian F squared rather than a gradient. And that's the soft escape that's gonna play an important role uh, in what I have to say. So one thing you can do right away is look at what happens at zero temperature. So zero temperature would involve minimizing this free energy and with various boundary conditions, you could be pulling on it with a stress or crushing it in various ways. Uh, and if you do that, um, uh, one way to understand it is you have to have a zero force balance locally with this stress tensor. The stress tensor is related to the strain tensor, that's Hooke's law with these elastic constants. And this constraint can be formally solved for by rewriting things in terms of this airy stress function. So it's a scalar function in this simple uh, two-dimensional problem. And then when you minimize, uh, you get these uh, famous foppel von Karman equations that um, are themselves quite formidable. Um, Landau and Lifshitz derive them and say that, uh, well, we really don't know how to solve them in general. There's just a few very special cases, but they're quite interesting for a number of reasons. One is this resembles a kind of baby form of uh, general relativity. Uh, it has extrinsic curvature, so it's not like the conventional relativity in that sense. But the source term, for example, of this airy stress function uh, 
when expressed in terms of these out of plane flexural uh, phonon field is the Gaussian curvature. So it's a source for the Aries stress function. Um, if you were to um, uh, add a defect, like a disclination defect, uh, cut out a little uh, sector of a sheet of paper and glue it back together again, uh, that would be a, like a delta function source term. That would be like a mass in a, a theory of gravity. And you can see these, uh, th th these various lines, uh, lattice lines are bent, uh, just like light would be bent, phonons will be bent by this disclination charge uh, at, at the apex here. Uh, and then there's this uh, nonlinear piece here. And then as you'll see, uh, the bending rigidity of uh, objects like graphene or even like a piece of paper are really quite uh, small. It's really quite small. And the Young's modulus is gigantic. And we have the reciprocal of that here. So the small quantities in the problem, the bending rigidity and one over the Young's modulus are all multiplying the highest derivative in the problem. And when you have nonlinear uh, partial differential equations, uh, like the Navier-Stokes equations where the viscosity is small, uh, multiplying the highest derivative of the problem, interesting new physics emerges. Um, and one way of parameterizing that that's convenient uh, is to take the Young's modulus, which is this combination of elastic constants, multiply by the size of the sheet squared and divide by the bending rigidity. Um, if this were a continuum material, uh, it would be the, uh, uh, the size divided by the thickness squared. And uh, I don't know if anybody can see me, but maybe you can hear me uh, take this piece of tinfoil and, and just crumple it, okay? And, and uh, I defy you to calculate the fractal dimension of this piece of tinfoil um, or a crumpled piece of paper. Uh, it's Foppel von Karman number. If you try to do perturbation theory, you're basically doing perturbation theory in the Foppel von Karman number. Um, it's about a million. So, you know, good luck doing perturbation theory in power series in a million. Uh, and for graphene, uh, it's even stronger nonlinearity. So even at zero temperature, this is a challenging uh, and beautiful problem. And many beautiful things are uh, worked out and studied. It's sometimes now called the field of extreme mechanics uh, when you have thin sheets and, and thin shells as well. So, um, uh, how do we do this statistical mechanics uh, of this? And we now go to elevated temperatures. Well, one trick that's kind of useful is to, if I go backwards here, I need to go back to uh, our, whoops, I'm going forwards. Back here, let's see. All right. go this way, I think is what I want to do. Yeah, if I look at this, um, th 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 this problem, this energy, one thing that's simple about it is these in-plane phonon fields only occur quadratically. Uh, there's non-trivial stuff happening with the flexural phonons, but because they're only quadratic, I can just integrate them out, just do a bunch of Gaussian integrals uh, to try to figure out what's going on. And, um, uh, and that's summarized here. If you just trace out uh, and get an effective free energy involving the F field alone, you get a, a massless field theory. Um, it, it has gradients, it has, in fact, has a little Laplacian of F squared and the bending rigidity, that was there already. But now this is what lets you violate the merman wagner theorem, uh, it turns out. Uh, these derivatives of F are like little, you can think of them as little tipping vectors of the Heisenberg spins, the normals, to the surface. Uh, and there's a transverse projection operator that, that, that acts here uh, in, in just such a way uh, as to produce effectively a kind of long range interaction, although the original problem only has short range interactions. Uh, there are two fields. And by having the two fields, integrating one of them out, we, we violate the theorem. And then the, the, the penalty or the nonlinearity here, it's a kind of cortic nonlinearity, uh, is the Young's modulus itself. Um, and, um, and then you can do, for example, a low temperature perturbation theory a power series and temperature divided by this bending rigidity. That's a dimensionless number. It's typically like one over 50 uh, in many soft condensed matter systems. And there's a set of Feynman diagrams that lets you calculate the effect of this thing systematically. And even if you just do straightforward perturbation theory, as, as, as uh, 
was worked out by Baduca Politi and myself about 30 years ago, um, you find something interesting. This renormalized bending rigidity, the bending rigidity in the presence of these thermal fluctuations acquires a correction, just from this first diagram, um, that uh, has a very strong infrared divergence. And you can see it has four powers of wave vector in the denominator here. It's only a two dimensional integral. And when you do the integral, you find that the correction to the bending rigidity at long wavelengths um, is proportional to KBT over kappa. That's the original perturbation theory, that's good. There's a one over 32 pi cube that makes the correction nominally even smaller. But because of this infrared divergence, what comes out in front is precisely this Falco von Karman number, the quantity which is about a million for a piece of paper. And as we'll see for graphene, it's 10 to the 12th. Um, so it's a, it's a singular perturbation theory. Now, one thing you can do is um, sum up the most divergent graphs at every order in perturbation theory. That produces a renormalized bending rigidity here in the denominators, basically just a Dyson equation. And then you solve this problem self-consistently. And if you do that, then something interesting happens. Uh, this bending rigidity becomes scale dependent. The elastic constant, this one in particular, is not a constant. Uh, it depends on the size of the system or on, on the wave vector in this very strong singular way. It in fact diverges as the wave vector goes to zero. So this is if you like the it controls the energy of a long wavelength ripple in this thermally excited membrane. Um, and then um, uh, shortly after this self-consistent calculation was done, um, a more systematic way of handling this problem was uh, implemented by uh, a number of people. It's, it was the renormalization group uh, calculation. We integrate out the short wavelength fluctuations. And in my view, uh, this was a real triumph of the renormalization group because what was discovered was that the Falco von Karman physics, the zero temperature physics down here, at finite temperatures, these are the scaled elastic constants, but you can think of them as basically being proportional to temperature, is unstable. An unstable, it's unstable to a new thermalized Foppel von Karman fixed point with scale dependent elastic constants. And in fact, uh, the result of these calculations was that uh, the bending rigidity uh, depends on the link scale uh, of the problem that you're looking at. A big sheet will have a different bending rigidity than a small sheet. And it all depends on this, the, this link scale L relative to a thermal length, um, which uh, is kind of a Ginsburg criterion uh, for this problem. You can figure out the thermal length by just asking, when is this correction comparable to what it's correcting? And, and, the, and when you get a big enough system, it will always be comparable. And you ask, what is the, what is the minimum system size needed to have this happen? So that's this, um, this thermal length, which you can get from the parameters kappa and y and temperature. Um, and if you're bigger than that thermal length, this bending rigidity becomes scale dependent. The Young's modulus um, is also scale dependent. It gets softer and softer. And you know, that, that's not too surprising. Uh, if you take a, a wrinkled piece of paper, um, it's very soft because of the stored extra area uh, in the wrinkles. And there, these are universal critical exponents, uh, 0 0.82, 0 0.36, that characterize this softening. Uh, so that's where we were um, uh, until a new generation of, experimental, uh, of, of experiments came along uh, to motivate us uh, further. And that's where I'm headed. Any questions at this point? Yeah. David, as far as I can see, this is a fully classical treatment. Yes. So my question is, how important would be the quantum fluctuation? They can, thank you for the question, Eduardo. They can be very important. And people have looked um, uh, at uh, the physics of these flexural phonons um, at uh, low temperatures. Um, and you'd have to do the experiment in a vacuum. Uh, you couldn't do it with water, water would freeze. Um, uh, but uh, uh, there can be important corrections at low temperatures. 
But what I'll be talking about is physics at room temperature when we can treat these phonons, both in-plane and flexural, classically. But I'll return to this question about quantum mechanics uh, briefly, and we'll see that uh, even if the phonons can be treated classically and not quantized, um, if the temperature is high enough to treat them classically, the Dirac electrons of graphene um, will we'll couple to them in a non-trivial way, and we'll have to consider quantum mechanics in that context. Well, anybody? Thanks. Yeah, sure. Okay, so things changed for me um, uh, when uh, some this experimental group at Cornell studied the physics of freely supported graphene at 300 degrees Kelvin. Um, here's an artist's conception of thermalized graphene. This is a gold pad. Um, it's one atom thick, um, has an enormous Young's modulus. That's why people say graphene is so strong, a very small bending rigidity. If you calculate the Foppel von Karman number, it, now that we've reached the Moore's law limit of thinness, you'll never get anything thinner than this. It's atomically thin. Uh, in this Moore's law limit, the Foppel von Karman number, if this is say 10 microns across, is extremely large. It's 10 to the 12th. <laughs> and, and you really do need a renormalization group or a self-consistent theory to, to figure out what's going on. And moreover, as was pointed out by McEwen and collaborators, if you just ask what is the thermal length, the length beyond which it's essential to look at these running coupling constants, like the bending rigidity and the Young's modulus, which are changing as a function of length scale with universal critical exponents, that thermal length for graphene parameters comes out to be about two or three angstroms. So at least at room temperature. So at all length scales bigger than that, you better pay attention to this stuff. So um, uh, this measurement, uh, which is now about five or six years old, was done uh, with a cantilever in water, the thin graphene ribbon, 10 microns across. Uh, and you can, you can look at how the uh, gold pad weighs, weighs it down. It's a classic experiment, uh, goes back to Galileo uh, in his, his dialogues. Uh, he was also interested in, in cantilevers in 1638. But this is an atomically thin cantilever. They also turned it on its side and then look at the thermal fluctuations. That's another way to measure the strength, the bending. We did it for a width of uh, 10 microns. And the ex expectation from uh, density functional atomic calculations at zero temperature was that this, this spring constant, which is related to the bending rigidity, would be down here in this log-log plot corresponding to a bending rigidity of 1.2 electron volts. In fact, it was seven kilo electron volts. The largest enhancement uh, I've ever seen of a material property of, of uh, uh, something uh, in, in least uh, hard condensed matter physics. And the bending rigidity is enhanced by a factor of 4,000. And if you just put in this running coupling constant, unfortunately they, they didn't vary W, that would have been really nice, and put in eta equals 0.8, um, uh, you, you'll capture this 4,000 fold enhancement in the many different lengths of cantilever here. So uh, it's at least some evidence that uh, something interesting is happening. Uh, and, uh, and there are other interesting things that I, I hope these people will actually measure uh, more precisely. There haven't been too many more additional experiments, there's some, some a few scattered beautiful ones. Um, one of the things that uh, is quite peculiar about these thermally wrinkled materials is their negative coefficient of thermal expansion. That's something that we often associate with rubber bands, but not necessarily with graphene. Uh, and not only is there a negative coefficient of thermal expansion, there's a nonlinear stress strain curve. Um, and so you, you can imagine stressing these things in various ways. Uh, looking, this is like the propagator of the theory with the uh, renormalization of the bending rigidity taken into account. Here's this strange critical exponent. The results of these calculations, which we now know how to do rather accurately, even if the Foppel von Karman number is huge, at finite temperature, is that there's a shrinkage in the area 
due to thermal fluctuations, just like this wrinkled uh, piece of paper is smaller than eight and a half by 11 inches that maybe it used to be um, uh, because of the wrinkles. And if you work that out, um, there's a shrinkage and then there's the usual relation uh, between any stress you put on and material stretching. Um, uh, this, this is uh, an external stress sigma, and this is the bulk modulus. And then there's a nonlinear power here, a power law that uh, dominates for small sigma. So that, that's a striking, for me, a striking uh, breakdown of conventional elasticity theory. Uh, when sigma is equal to zero, and I, I eliminate this term and this term, uh, I still get an interesting thermal shrinkage, like a rubber band. There's a negative coefficient of thermal expansion. And uh, that's the, uh, for those of you that don't remember, that's the, this relative uh, diminution in the area as you change temperature. This is the, the formula that comes out of this theory. Um, and in fact, uh, with simulations, um, uh, my colleague Paul Hanakata has measured uh, the shrinkage both at high temperature and low temperature. I think he has periodic boundary conditions uh, in these simulations, so it can shrink as it wishes. Um, and um, in fact, uh, here's the area as you increase temperature in this thermalized sheet with say graphene-like parameters. And uh, if you take a derivative, this is the thermal expansion um, uh, uh, results from the simulations. Um, and uh, this uh, dashed line is a, a fit to the theory with no adjustable parameters. So we seem to be saying something right here. Not only is there enhancement in the bending rigidity, there's this anomalous thermal expansion. That's gonna play an important role in the second half uh, of this talk, as you'll see. Um, so um, this strange behavior of flexural phonons has not escaped the attention of professional graphene theorists, of which I am not one, uh, but I do find it a fascinating study. And now, of course, you all know, many of you know that graphene has this very unusual uh, band structure with uh, Dirac-like uh, cones um, at the edge of the Fermi surface. And if we now reintroduce fermions, even if we're doing it at room temperature, those fermions effectively are at very low temperatures. Quantum mechanics is important. And we can add to that Hamiltonian some extra degrees of freedom that couple to flexural phonons. So these are fermion creation and destruction operators uh, in a tight binding model of graphene. Um, this is uh, the uh, tunneling matrix element between site I and site J but it's going to be stretched and changed by the flexural phonons. And so in addition to the usual electron phonon coupling, you know, like, like the one that gives rise to superconductivity, there is electron flexural phonon coupling that was studied by uh, Mariani and Von Oppen, for example. There's more recent work by Finkelstein and collaborators. I won't go into details, but they, they calculated electron dephasing time, which is a relative, depending on how close you are to some Fermi surface or the, 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 the Dirac cone point um, at low temperatures. And lo and behold, this uh, exponent eta, this soft condensed matter polymer exponent comes into this quantum mechanical quantity. So in my opinion, there's a lot more things to be done. And in particular, if you could get graphene to crumple and have a sort of general baby version of general relativity on steroids and ask what are the electrons doing uh, in some crumpled version of graphene. Uh, there, there's lots of, uh, I think, fascinating science. That's not what I'm gonna talk about here. I'm gonna explore whether there are other examples of this kind of extreme statistical mechanics with the flexural phonons coupled to alternative but classical internal degrees of freedom. And we'll see, I hope, that that already is quite intriguing. Any questions uh, so far uh, at this point? Not hearing any. Um, let me move on and motivate the rest of the remainder of this talk 
by just the phenomena, very common phenomena of size differences in um, uh, two element atomic monolayers. So here's one, tin oxide. Um, and what happens is a kind of antiferromagnetic coupling of the buckles out of this isolated plane of tin oxide. And so uh, the red are oxygens and the gray and black are tin. Some of them, half of them are above the plane. Uh, the other half are below the plane. So there's a kind of antiferromagnetic ordering going on, at least at zero temperature. Um, uh, here's another version of this uh, buckling question, uh, lead sulfide, uh, where uh, the yellow are the sulfur, and then the lead, or it could be some other calcogenides substituted here, uh, are, are all above the plane. So they interact uh, between, uh, from going from lead to lead in a ferromagnetic way. They're all on the same side of the sulfur sheet, as opposed to the antiferromagnetic way that is happening with the tin. So both of these can happen. And we tried, to, we tried to find a model that was simple enough for us to do precision uh, uh, simulations uh, with thermal fluctuations of this problem. And so here's one that has been developed over the years where uh, you imagine a, a bunch of balls and springs. This will be a classical simulation, but I hope uh, you'll see that it's already quite challenging and rich, uh, where I have a spring constant that uh, tries to keep uh, these bonds, either diagonal or, uh, or, or horizontal or vertical uh, in some uh, specific length. And then I haven't drawn it here, but imagine for above every, every centered on every one of these triangles, I erect a normal. These are the normal fluctuations that make this look like a Heisenberg model uh, that, that, uh, for which you evade the Holmberg Merman Wagner theorem. And so there's just a dot product interaction between neighboring normals, a normal here and a normal here. So this is sum over neighboring plaquettes in this square lattice. And now let's imagine that we turn on um, a kind of stretching dilation interaction associated with a particular, it's called an impurity site, but it could be um, uh, a, a, a tin atom that just happens to have a bigger van der Waals radius or some size parameter compared to the, to the blue. So this thing um, is maybe one plus delta longer than, than its neighbor, something similar on the diagonal. Then we can define a local Fapo von Karman number, which is the extra area that this dilation would like to impose on the uh, system if it didn't uh, buckle into the third dimension. Um, and uh, that extra area turns out to be linear in delta and go like the lattice constant squared. Um, uh, so there's a local Fapo von Karman number. You can also, I won't talk much about it, let delta be negative. Then you get, instead of when it buckles, uh, positive Gaussian curvature uh, localized somewhere, you get negative Gaussian curvature. We call those stitches. You're, you're, you're excising material and sewing it back together again. And so uh, this is a, uh, uh, I think a, a simulation by uh, Abby Plummer, uh, and my other collaborator besides Paul Hanakata. And if you look at this thing and you make delta bigger and bigger, so you effectively increase in gamma, you can see that eventually this thing escapes into the third dimension. It buckles and leaves the plane um, and uh, changes the physics. Uh, uh, of the problem, uh, and in particular, it, it, it changes what it leaves behind, these unbuckled sites. And what um, Abby and Paul discovered was that if you set up a very simple model of this kind, you do get a buckled antiferromagnetic uh, ground state, just like tin oxide. Um, it's not the quantum mechanical version of tin oxide, it's a kind of classical version, but it's something with this very simple model uh, that you can elevate the finite temperatures uh, and they basically created here a mechanical analog of an easing antiferromagnet. And if you look at this thing, uh, and you just look at the puckers and see uh, whether the puckers are up or down, right? There's a broken symmetry. Uh, it could either pucker up or down here. Um, and then as a function of temperature measured in units of the bending rigidity, 
um, there's an order disorder transition. We all know about the two-dimensional easing model. This happens to be an easing antiferromagnet. But the interesting thing, as I hope to show you, is that it's coupled to the flexural phonons. And um, if you just look at these um, images of the puckers, they start from being antiferromagnetic largely, and they go through an order disorder transition at about 0.2 kappa. If this were uh, tin oxide, that would be about 800 degrees Kelvin, but they ride on a fluctuating background of flexural phonons. And you can measure lots of things. This is a measure of the staggered magnetization. Uh, you just flip the sign of all these mechanical analogs of spins and, and then it looks like a regular magnetization. But if you look at the magnetization squared, which is particularly easy uh, to measure, it could be puckers or stitches, you get this kind of behavior. And it turns out the phase transition, which I'll talk about later, as you see in the specific heat and the susceptibility occurs roughly on the shoulder of this staggered magnetization squared. And it has a T to the one minus alpha specific heat like singularity. Um, but it's, it's a complicated problem because it's not um, your uh, grandparents easing model. It's an easing model, which is fluctuating. It's almost as if you were playing a game of, uh, of football uh, or what we call soccer. And the players are the easing spins running around, going up and down or whatever. And the, the arena in which they're playing is itself alive and fluctuating and influenced by how they're playing. That's what I want to talk about. Any questions? OK, so uh, here's a picture of the puckers in more, more detail. Uh, and some of these are up, some of these are down. Uh, this thing could crumple at very high temperatures. We won't talk about that here. But I want to ask, how does this easing mechanical antiferromagnet of puckers interact with these flexural phonons? What kind of, is anything interesting going to happen? And one way to study that, we're just trying to make some progress with this. This is work in progress. Uh, as I said, the work we, we did largely during the lockdown. <laughs> Which, is, which still continues more or less in New England. So we're still trying to make progress with lots of Zoom meetings. So the effective energy or Hamiltonian will have elastic part. That's what we've already talked about. There'll be an easing Hamiltonian describing the antiferromagnetism of the puckers and there'll be an interaction. And the question is whether these two things are gonna be talking to each other. So let's take a look. So here's a, here's a picture again uh, of these uh, mechanical spins, antiferromagnetic spins. Here's a corrugated checkerboard mat, uh, pattern of buckling. Here's a high temperature version of all this. And what we're going to do is couple the local staggered magnetization uh, to a strain field, just the phonons we've already talked about. So this is the this is how you usually define a say a macroscopic staggered magnetization. You flip the sign of every other spin to make it look like a ferromagnetic Ising model, just to make it a little easier to think about. Um, and here's the model that we've been playing with. Um, has a number of ingredients. One of the ingredients we've just been talking about is this uh, uh, interesting uh, uh, sort of uh, massless field theory uh, associated with the, uh, the stretching, the nonlinear strain, tensor, uh, the bending rigidity, et cetera. So that, that's what pristine graphene would be described by, we believe. There's also, of course, an easing model. So this is the easing model written in terms of the staggered magnetization. And this is the classic Landau, Ginsburg, Wilson model with this R changes sign at a critical point and stuff like that. But this is a highly compressible easing model, as I hope to convince you, I like to call it a compressible easing model on steroids because of these flexural phonons. And if you ask yourself what is allowed by symmetry, then the, the constraints of uh, up-down symmetry for the antiferromagnetism and rotational invariance and stuff like that, the, the, the leading term you can have goes like the staggered magnetization squared um, times um, the, the trace of this nonlinear uh, strain tensor. So that's the, uh, that's the coupling. And I want to tell you 
uh, what we know about this system. Uh, uh, of course, one of the first thing you can do is to trace out these phonons and get an easing order parameter uh, coupled to just now the flexural phonons. And we have just what we talked about before. We have this easing model, but now there's two interesting things. This G coupling, uh, uh, this W is proportional to G, allows the stagger magnetization squared to talk to this strange operator here, which if you take its Laplacian is just the Gaussian curvature. So the Gaussian curvature uh, talks to the Ising order parameter. That's one interesting thing about it. The other is that when you trace out the in-plane phonons, you get long range interactions with this the easing model. That's represented by this thing here, uh, where V is some expressible in terms of these, these coupling concepts. And the physics of the G coupling, I'd like to illustrate with this box of bowling pins. <laughs> um, if G is greater than zero, which I think we think that's the case here, what it says is that um, if you go above TC in this antiferromagnet of easing puckers, um, they won't be able to pack as efficiently. So the, the, these bowling pins are below TC and you can fill more of them in the box than if they have a random up-down orientation. And they would swell when things uh, disorder. And so we expect a kind of swelling. And in fact, you can take this relatively simple model and literally calculate the thermal expansion that I was talking about earlier. So here's this thermal expansion coefficient, the relative change in area. And then guess what? There's a contribution due to the rubber-like um, uh, physics of the flexural phonons tending to shrink things. But now this G coupling uh, produces um, a term that involves the derivative of this staggered magnetization squared with respect to temperature. That has a negative slope. So this term shrinks and this term swells. We get both entropic shrinkage and expansion. And some measure of the importance of this coupling can be provided, was provided by Paul Hanakata's beautiful simulations of the shrinkage going through the easing-like phase transition, which occurs at about 0.2 here. And so here's the area dropping, dropping, dropping for both stitches which are uh, red and puckers, which are blue. And then suddenly something happens at the phase transition. It's a huge effect. Uh, it changes the sign of the negative coefficient of thermal expansion. In fact, we think, we suspect this has a specific heat-like singularity uh, uh, that you might get from, from uh, this differentiation here. Um, so that, to me, suggests that this coupling is going to change the physics in a profound way. Uh, what we have basically is a is a massless field theory up here, coupled to an easing field theory, which can become massless when this when this quadratic term goes to zero. So this is always critical in this model. And this can become critical at the easing uh, TC. So we're still trying to figure this out, uh, but Paul's simulations of the specific heat and staggered susceptibility in the magnetization suggests that this icing ordering transition of puckers coupled to uh, flexural phonons, a uh, compressible easing model, highly compressible on steroids, maybe in a new two-dimensional universality class, something that I at least have not encountered uh, in, in my uh, career. Um, so if you study, for example, the specific heat, um, and there's finite size scaling ways of, of, of extracting this exponent that are pretty accurate for conventional easing models, you discover that alpha over nu is 0.1. Chi, alpha over nu is 1.75. And then the beta over nu for similar finite size scaling analysis is about 0.13. So it's still work in progress. Um, it may be a new, new universality class, we'll have to see. But here are the Ansager exponents that many of us learn in elementary classes on statistical uh, mechanics. Um, and uh, there's a logarithmic singularity in specific heat, et cetera, beta is 1 8, gamma is 
uh, seven fours, nu is one, and we're getting a different set of exponents. Whether we can be sure that uh, the error bars wouldn't allow these to become the same, we're still working on that. But preliminarily, the exponents seem quite different. And if any of you can uh, repeat Hans Eiger's feat of including the flexural phonons and solving this problem for us in any form, please let me know. Okay, that's the lockdown research that we're trying to finish up now. Let me conclude with just a couple slides on another problem, which I think becomes fascinating when we talk about super thin objects. So ultimately, I want you to think about maybe a giant buckyball that is atomically thin and has um, you know, maybe dimensions of 10 microns, something like that. Let's ask, what would thermal fluctuations do to that thing? And this is a, a movie that I learned about from John Hutchinson, but it, 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 it's a, a, an instructive movie. Uh, if I remember correctly from John, somebody is, is, is extracting water from this tanker or some liquid from this tanker, leaving behind a vacuum. Uh, so you're pumping the water out. I love this. This is great. Here it happens again. So, so be, be extremely careful removing liquids. Uh, and, uh, and this is just being crushed by atmospheric pressure. Um, so I want to ask, what about crushing atomically thin objects? Um, what happens on the nanoscale? So I won't go into the details. I've almost exhausted my time here, but uh, you can work out the same kind of uh, statistical mechanics as I did with Andre and Jason Pelos and stuff uh, with a background curvature, say the background curvature of a sphere, just to keep it simple. You can go through the same uh, analysis of these fluctuating flexural phonons in plane displacement and something new appears well known to people like John Hutchinson and Coiter and others, but there's a new term in this, what I used to call a vector potential. It breaks the up-down symmetry. It's quite, it's linear in, in F and it goes like one over the radius of the sphere. I won't go into the details, but uh, you get new terms uh, in this uh, fluctuating uh, uh, statistical mechanical model F and you trace out the phonons and stuff like that. Here are, here's, here's the effect of a pressure, uh, an outside pressure. That's what crushed that railroad car. And now we have uh, an interacting, a new interaction and a new quadratic term. Uh, and you can study what's going on. There's a new length scale uh, that goes like uh, the radius of the, the sphere divided by the fourth power, fourth root of the Fapel von Karman number. That's just geometric mean of the thickness times the radius. And I'll just summarize with our conclusion, which I think is remarkable. If you put in the thermal uh, fluctuations uh, associated with scale dependent bending rigidity and Young's modulus, uh, you get a phase diagram of buckling. Now we have to be careful uh, as uh, experts in this area know about imperfections, changing the, the buckling and stuff like that. But even if there are no imperfections, the thermal imperfections, so to speak. The thermal fluctuations change things dramatically. So this is the classical buckling threshold. It's, it's one in these units at zero temperature. So this is temperature rescaled by the Foppel von Karman number on this logarithmic scale. And one of the things that I thought was really cool that Andre figured out was that at zero pressure, even if there's no physical pressure, like osmotic pressure or some other way of applying pressure, the thing can be crushed by thermal fluctuations alone, coupled to this background Gaussian curvature. And so at zero pressure, there's a buckling transition out here, just as there is uh, all along this line. This is a line of buckling transitions. Easier to buckle when you get to high temperatures, but you can buckle even at uh, zero pressure. And so if someone tries to sell you uh, a graphene parachute, don't uh, invest, uh, don't buy it, because you can apply the same analysis to a hemisphere of graphene or some atomically thin sheet, 
and you predict that amorphous domes uh, will collapse above a critical size. And if you work out that size for, as Andre and I did, for a room temperature with the parameters of graphene, that size um, is 1600 angstroms. So anything bigger than that, a hemisphere, let's say, a graphene parachute will collapse just due to thermal fluctuations alone. So with that prediction, which as you can tell, I kind of like, I will stop. Thank you for your attention and happy to take uh, further questions. Thank you very much, David, for the beautiful talk. And I, I ask everyone to sign up for chat uh, to, to ask the question, to, to observe the order of questions. So uh, I don't see any people sign up now. Dimitri, can I make a question? Okay, please go on. Uh, go ahead, Fabio. Thank you. Thank you, Professor David, for this nice same seminar. I, I was in doubt, how do you characterize this flex, flexural phonons? Because you said that in the major part of your talk that you are doing a classical treatment, right? Yes. So uh, how do you characterize them? There is a relation, a dis dispersion relation? Yes. Yes, so there, there's the, the, the dispersion relation is um, omega of k equals kappa k to the fourth. So uh, they have a, a, and you can quantize that. People have done that at low temperatures if you want. Um, that's the, the, the classical dispersion relation of the out of plane phonons. And because it's, um, I mean, it, that, that would be the energy, I should say. The energy goes like kappa k to the fourth. If you wanted, if you were in a vacuum and you wanted to get a dispersion relation, uh, then it would be omega goes like um, uh, the square root of the bending rigidity times k squared. In that sense, they're extremely, they're still extremely soft. Uh, their energy goes to zero like k squared, and then you can quantize them, and very interesting things happen when you do that. Thank you. Uh, my second question uh, would be about the crush of the spheres that, that you told in the, in the yes. end of, of your talk. Yes, yes. in that, that, that graph. You said this uh, amazing result that even at zero pressure, you can crush the sphere. And you, yeah. you, you explained it by means of the thermal fluctuations. But I would yeah. like to know if there are more fundamental physical reasons by, by that, if it quantum fluctuations also could do that? Ah, that's a very interesting question. And I think it's quite possible that quantum fluctuations, zero point motion um, in a, uh, you know, so you'd have to do it in a vacuum probably experimentally, but that quantum fluctuations uh, will, uh, you know, we, we know as you know very well that, um, Quantum fluctuations at zero temperature and atmospheric pressure can cause a quantum solid of helium-4 to melt. Um, and there will be zero point motion, zero point flexural phonon motion, zero point in-plane uh, phonon motion of these shells. And even if the covalent bonds hold together at zero temperature, I think it's quite possible that there could be some quantum analog. Uh, yes, because as you know, at, at zero temperature, you, you, we can have the Casimir effect and there you, you can have a, a pressure, yes. right? Absolutely, so it, it, it's very much like the Casimir problem, but you would need to do it with a background um, included, uh, but uh, it shouldn't be too hard, I think, to do the quantum, uh, you know, the quantization basically uh, of this problem. Um, just like we do in elementary solid state physics, uh, the by theory of solids, um, uh, he piggybacked on this classical picture of phonons and took these dispersion relations and put in uh, creation and destruction operators. That's how we would do it nowadays. Um, and uh, I would think it would be very interesting uh, to follow up on your idea and look at a, at a hemisphere of graphene and see what, under what conditions uh, would, could the quantum fluctuations be strong enough uh, to not necessarily melt it, but to 
cause it to crush. Uh, as, you, as you noticed, it's a kind of no-go theorem that we have here. We claim you cannot make a atomically thin shell much bigger than 160 nanometers. If there is such a result for a zero temperature for a quantum system, I would definitely like to know about it. Right, thank you for, in, in, for answering, Professor David. Do we have other questions? Uh, I had one question, which I think was partially answered in, in the end of the talk, uh, but it, it's about this elastic energy, which is probably the basic energy functional you can write in terms of your degrees of freedom. And yeah. how, how general is that? And uh, what happens if you try to add different terms to, to this? Okay, like, well, um, so uh, you can, uh, so here, 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 if you can see my, uh, uh, my laser pointer, um, is, is this thing that's generally allowed by symmetry? And what are the symmetries? Well, if you didn't have a background curvature, um, you want to have, uh, it has to be even in F because the fluctuations up are the same as the fluctuations down, it has to be translationally invariant, uh, has to be rotationally invariant, and so forth. And then this, these are the leading terms you can write down. The higher order terms are, uh, might be um, uh, third power of uij. It would be the trace of, uh, of a, a triple product of strain tensors could occur at higher order. Um, that's a standard kind of phonon anharmonicity, either whether you quantize it or not. Um, and uh, the uh, and and for the problems I'm looking at here, they they're higher order in the gradients because they're the third power of the strain tensor, and they appear to be irrelevant variables. Uh, and the, similarly here, you can you can put higher gradients if you want. And that seems to be irrelevant. So the, the long wavelength universal low energy content of this theory um, uh, is, is probably well captured by this, this truncation. Uh, but I can couple it to using antiferromagnets. I can couple it to Dirac electrons. And then uh, we don't know what happens. The, the electrons can affect the physics of the flexural phonons and vice versa. Okay, uh, thank you. Uh, oh, if there are no other questions, uh, let me thank uh, uh, David for his presentation and everybody who participated in, in our seminar. Uh, before we leave, I, I kindly, kindly ask everyone uh, to, well, everyone who can uh, turn on the camera for us to make a picture. Uh, yes. Valdelino, can you can you make a, please make a picture for the record of our seminars? And well, I, uh, let, let me thank you all for coming, and uh, I hope to see many of you again in person when we're all safely vaccinated. I hope I hope that happens soon. <laughs> uh, we all do. We all do. <laughs> Yeah, while uh, I think Valdelino is making the picture, uh, I, I'll just remind you that we will continue our se series of seminars now uh, on Wednesdays, and please join us uh, next week with more seminars. So Valdelino, how, how are we with pictures? Okay, okay, thank you everyone once again. Thank you, David, and I see you next week. Good afternoon, guys. All the best. Bye. Yeah, stay, the best. Stay, stay safe, everybody. You too. You Great too. Talk, David. Thanks a lot. Great talk, David. Great talk.